When the original Subnautica came out of Early Access in 2018, it quickly became one of those special games for me. The kind that makes sleeping and eating feel like annoying chores that keep you from playing it, and the kind that leaves a big hole behind when you finally complete it. It's a game I was recommending to friends at the time as a brand new, unique experience, and a cure for gamer fatigue. What's that? Stuck feeling like every modern game is exactly the same? Play two hours of Subnautica and call me in the morning. It may have looked like just another survival game on the surface, but once you dived beneath that surface, you'd find that the survival mechanics were just a shroud obscuring the real substance of the game. Exploring, discovering, and coming to understand an alien environment. Looking back now, and especially after playing the sequel, the thing about Subnautica that hit home so hard at the time, and made it so special, was its immersive quality. Subnautica begins with almost no introduction or context given to the player outside of the short intro cutscene. And what more context could you possibly need than the very first thing you see when you take control? It's a castaway story. Your ship has crashed, there's nobody else around, you're alone and completely surrounded by water. It's immediately obvious what the first priorities would be for someone in that situation. Finding a source of food and drinkable water. And now you are in that situation, so that's exactly what you start doing. When your PDA eventually notifies you of other escape pods that have crashed nearby, of course you want to go and check them out. When a second ship detects a distress call and attempts to come and help, of course you want to go to their landing site and see what happens. When you discover the remnants of alien artifacts, of course you want to find more and see what their story is. And if you'd rather spend time exploring on your own or building yourself a cozy base, then that's also fine because with the exception of the arrival of the second ship, you have all the time in the world, and outside of some guidance from the PDA, you don't have anyone telling you what you have to do. Unlike many survival games, the world is handcrafted rather than procedurally generated, and there are stories to discover, and an ending which sees you building a rocket to escape from the planet you're stranded on. But all of that is secondary to the main draw of the game, the experience of surviving a shipwreck and being thrust into a terrifying situation with only your wits to rely on. Your player character never speaks in Subnautica, and why would they? At pretty much every point in the game, their motivations and your motivations as a player are almost perfectly aligned, and I think this is the real key to that immersive experience. Compare it to something like Half-Life, which also has a silent protagonist, but doesn't hold a candle to Subnautica in terms of immersion. It's generally accepted as canon that Gordon Freeman doesn't jump on Alex's head in every cutscene but the game, I think quite begrudgingly, lets you do it anyway. Obviously this is an example of the player deliberately spoiling their own immersion and acting erratically, but it's nevertheless a problem that first-person games have been struggling to solve for a long time. My goodness, Gordon Freeman. It really is you, isn't it? In Subnautica, however, almost anything the player might do can be rationalised in some way as a realistic response to the situation they find themselves in with the possible exception of suicidally swimming towards monsters without protection. Although if you're purposely doing that, then you were presumably not feeling very immersed in the first place. Everything you do becomes part of your unique Subnautica story, with every action you perform being canon to that personal story. It's the same reason that Link doesn't talk in the Zelda series. The intention is for you to become the protagonist while you're playing the game as much as possible. Anyone not convinced of the immersive potential of games owes it to themselves to give Subnautica a play, because it's probably the best evidence there is that a future where everyone lives in virtual worlds instead of reality isn't such a far-fetched idea, and I'm only half joking. There actually is a VR version of Subnautica that I'm not lucky enough to have played, but I'm going to go ahead and assume that it would blow my tiny little mind if I did. Still, at the time, even the non-VR version was the most immersive experience I'd had with a game up to that point, and has only been topped by one game since then. I think that brief review and summary of the original game was necessary before I get into my thoughts on the sequel, both to provide some context and because a lot of the same spirit from the first game is evident in Below Zero. At a glance, it looks like more of the same, and mechanically speaking it sort of is. Unfortunately, it was never the gameplay mechanics that made Subnautica so special in the first place and differences in the design of the sequel that first appear to be very small will eventually reveal their true power, reach their tentacles out and strangle all the enjoyment out of Below Zero before you're able to finish it. Or at least that's what happened to me. I'm going to mention the original game again at several points to make comparisons with the sequel, 
But for now, the important thing I want to get across is that immersion is the area where Subnautica really excelled. And I'm sure you've already guessed the reason I'm saying that so much before I move on to speaking about Below Zero. For the sake of clarity, throughout this video I'll refer to the original game as Subnautica and the sequel as Below Zero. Now, let's dive in. Below Zero takes place on the same planet as the first game, which is understandable considering that it was originally a DLC add-on that grew into something bigger. I'm sure it must have saved the dev team hundreds of hours of work to be able to reuse assets from the first game, but it's a decision that takes away from one of the highlights of that first game. That is to say, exploring a completely alien world and discovering new things as you go. If you've already played Subnautica, then the opening hours of Below Zero are going to feel very very familiar, from your early steps onto the tech tree and even down to the flora and fauna around you in the starting areas. In the first game, figuring out that bladderfish can be used as filters to create drinkable water is a learning experience that teaches you to pay attention to the world because knowledge can save your life. In the sequel, you already know that you can make water by grabbing a bladderfish, so you have no reason to experiment with solutions to the water problem. Sadly, this means that one of the main appeals of Subnautica, gameplay-wise, is pretty much absent from the first few hours of Below Zero, which I think was a serious misstep. What if, instead of doing the exact same thing you did in the last game, you had to take note of your surroundings, retrieve some snow or ice from the surface, and boil or sterilize it somehow? They could even have kept the bladderfish in the starting area as a fake-out and given the player a shock when they found out they could only be used for food and not for water in this game maybe because of a chemical difference in the seawater or something like that. These may not be amazing ideas, but literally anything would have been more interesting than just copying the first game. And the more I think about it, the more I'm surprised that the developers missed this obvious opportunity to make the player feel like they were in a brand new environment with new rules. Instead, I had the exact opposite feeling, like I was retreading old ground. So let's have a look at something that actually is new to the sequel. Perhaps the first gameplay difference you'll notice from the first game is the temperature gauge, which you're now limited by when you're on land. Yeah, you actually start the game on land in Below Zero, which just doesn't seem right to me, but I guess they wanted to introduce you to the new concept straight away. The body temperature stat works exactly the same as oxygen does underwater, and actually led to my only death while playing Below Zero, since I had assumed it would work like hunger or thirst, and that it would cause my health to start draining once the temperature meter hit zero. Instead, it just killed me straight away. There are a few ways to raise your temperature when you're on land. You can eat or drink consumables that have a warming effect, you can enter a habitat or cave for shelter, or you can stand near steam vents or these heat-emitting thermal flowers. I'm not sure why an organism would be intentionally shedding heat in this arctic environment, but this is one of those things you just need to let go. Later in the game, you're able to craft warmer clothing that can make your body temperature drop much more slowly, but in the early few hours, your time on land will be punctuated by searches for the next safe zone where you can warm up, as opposed to being underwater, and always knowing that you have a guaranteed route to oxygen by swimming upwards. Besides that minor difference, the body temperature gauge is mechanically almost identical to oxygen, and I appreciate the attempt at bringing something new to the sequel, but I think the idea could have been taken much further. In what I think is another possible missed opportunity, the temperature gauge only comes into effect when you're on land, and you never need to think about it while underwater. Because of this, jumping into icy cold water will instantly cure you of hypothermia in Below Zero. Look, I'm hardly an expert, so I can't say this with any authority, but I can't help myself from pointing out that this makes absolutely no fucking sense. I won't mention it again, because it might be a petty complaint, but it crossed my mind every time I dived into water to escape a falling temperature gauge. So right now you might be thinking, come on, do you really spend that much time on land in the sequel to Subnautica, the underwater exploration game? And the answer is yes. I'd say about a third of your time in Below Zero will be spent above water, which is a massive increase over the two fairly small islands found in Subnautica that don't take long to explore and don't really need to be visited more than once or twice each. Although the exact timing will depend on each player, 
you generally won't discover Subnautica's islands until the midpoint of the game, by which point they offer some variety and a temporary relief from the tension of being constantly underwater and never quite knowing what could be around you. In Below Zero you begin the game on land, and one of the very first places you're guided towards by a marker is a habitat on land in the very centre of the map. Almost every important crafting blueprint for your own base is found in habitats on land, including the builder tool itself, so it's pretty much unavoidable that you'll be frequently going above water in a playthrough of Below Zero. I presume this was done to get the most mileage out of the new temperature gauge, but I've already proposed a pretty obvious solution to that by making the gauge relevant while underwater as well, which the game never does, and in any case the body heat mechanic is almost identical to the oxygen limit when underwater, so it doesn't exactly bring that much new to the table anyway. The simple fact is that being on land is just less interesting than being underwater, because it takes away that third axis of movement and places the player in a safer and less alien feeling environment. This goes on the list of design changes where I have absolutely no idea what the developers were thinking. The other difference you might notice at the start of the game is a very small one, but it's the one that cascades into every other part of the game and changes absolutely everything about the experience of playing Below Zero. This is the big reveal you've been waiting for. This is the farthest that I can take you on company space bucks, Robin. You sure you want this? The research is in everything. It is to me. And Sam. I need to know what happened. In Below Zero, you don't play as a blank slate silent protagonist. You play as a scientist named Robin, who's come to the planet in search of answers about her sister's death. And I'm just gonna say it outright. This seemingly tiny difference deals a titanic blow to immersion that the game never recovers from. I'm not gonna say that it completely ruins the game, but it turns the experience into a very, very different one from its predecessor. And this is despite the fact that the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay is practically unchanged from the first game. In this way, Below Zero makes for a pretty fascinating case study in how a seemingly trivial difference in design can ripple out and change almost everything about a game. Subnautica is about you being stranded, and your motivation begins as simply as basic survival. The more you explore and discover in pursuit of that basic goal, the more your curiosity will be piqued until you're naturally invested in the story because of your own personal interactions with it. Below Zero is about a character with her own motivations that we know nothing about and care nothing about. It no longer makes narrative sense for the player to spend the early game building up a cosy base. Robin has clearly already travelled far enough in search of answers, so it makes no sense for her to waste time relaxing. With this small change to the sequel, the connection between player and character is completely severed, and the illusion that you're really on an alien world yourself is broken. If telling Robin's story was important to the developers, then they could have made it discoverable via exploration, just like the story of the survivors of the crashed ship Degassi from Subnautica. Discovery is supposed to be the whole point of the game, so I truly have no idea what purpose is served by forcing you to play as a defined character. This is another one for the list. I would even go as far as to say that by putting Robin's story front and center, the developers have stolen from you, yes you, the chance to have your own personal story in Below Zero, which was a major part of Subnautica's appeal. I genuinely can't fathom what they were trying to accomplish with this choice, and the frequent voice lines from Robin at key moments just made me annoyed more than anything else. Well, this is different. I want to be amazed and awestruck by the sights of ancient alien technology. I don't want to listen to somebody else being amazed by it. I'll just give some brief thoughts on the story of Below Zero, because I really don't think it's a strong point of the game, and since they axed the defining element of Subnautica in order to accommodate this new story, I think you could plausibly argue that it has negative value. Robin smuggles herself onto the planet 4546B to discover the truth of her sister's death, which was officially declared to be due to negligence. Yeah, I know, I said that already, but even the game itself doesn't seem to care about Robin's story, because it quickly gets overshadowed by a wider plot involving... <coughs> Alan, potentially the last member of the alien race that used to inhabit 4546B, who implants himself into Robin's head and instructs her on how to build a body for him to transfer his consciousness into. 
And if you think that sounds like a good basis for a series of fetch quests, then you're in good company playing this game. You, that is Robin, can wrap up what is now the side story of her sister's death early in your playthrough and pretty much forget all about it, which is exactly what I did. The alien plot might sound more interesting if you haven't played the game, but it's not. And it will still be fairly early into the game when you realise that the end goal will be to assemble the three parts needed for the alien body. Once I had that realisation, the remainder of the game started to feel increasingly like tedious work, with no mystery or intrigue to it at all. Compare that to the original Subnautica, in which your curiosity pushes you deeper and deeper to see what the hell you might find down there. It's not until you get right to the deepest point underwater that the final material gathering task is given to you, meaning that your curiosity is still being engaged right up until the end, and the final task is a mercifully short one that gives you a good excuse for a final lap of the different biomes. In Below Zero, your curiosity and desire to discover more isn't engaged at all by the plot because it plays its hand way, way too early. I think I've more than made my point about why it was a misguided choice to force the player to play as a defined character, but I want to go just a little bit further and say that not only was it a choice that goes against the strengths of the original game, it was a choice that goes against the strengths of the entire medium of games as a whole. The original Subnautica was an experience that could only be possible in a game. The experience of really being in a survival situation, with only your quick thinking and curiosity to rely on for salvation. It's an experience I've never seen replicated by another game, and by changing this focus for the sequel, the developers have done a huge disservice to fans of the first game, and planted the unfortunate question in my head of whether or not they even understood what made Subnautica such a unique and compelling experience to begin with. I've been fairly negative about Below Zero so far, so I think it's only fair I say some positive things as well, because the game does have its high points, among them the music and visuals. Simply put, it's a game that does very, very well with its first impressions. Ben Prunty stepped in to create the soundtrack, and he's been one of my favourite game composers since I first heard his music in FTL almost 10 years ago. His music always seems to perfectly suit the atmosphere of the game he's writing for, and in Below Zero it does a great job at underlining the sense of awe you feel when you find yourself looking out at a beautiful vista, although I will say that the music sometimes seems to fade in when nothing interesting is happening, and fade out just before it could have made its greatest impression. One of the biggest strengths of both Subnautica games is the way they encourage and reward the player for paying attention to their surroundings, which is encouraged because it's usually necessary for discovering new environments and materials, and rewarding because those environments can often be stunningly beautiful. I really mean it when I say that the visual design of these games is some of the most imaginative, fascinating, mind-blowing stuff I've seen in all media and just getting the chance to explore those incredible environments is honestly almost worth the price of admission alone. Almost. I don't think I'll ever forget stumbling into the Lost River in Subnautica, or coming across the Vent Garden in Below Zero, or gliding past the whales in the Lilypad Zone, and almost every new environment prompted me to look around in awed silence for a few minutes before getting on with my task. But that's exactly why I said that Below Zero makes for a good first impression, because after that is where the problems begin. The biomes truly are amazing when you first discover them, but that feeling of amazement is bound to fade over time, until all you're left with is whatever task brought you there to begin with. And as those tasks become increasingly tedious, which I'll explain in more detail shortly, and you find yourself going through the motions, heading back and forth to grab materials and construct upgrades, 
All the wonder that those visuals instilled in you on the first viewing will have dissolved into background noise, and all you'll be seeing is hitboxes and walls to avoid. And I think that fact reveals an unfortunate truth about immersion, namely that it has an enemy in predictability. More than anything else, playing Below Zero has taught me that immersion is a very fragile thing, kind of like an illusion that stops working as soon as you understand the mechanics behind it. And once that illusion is broken, there isn't really anything the game can do to get it back. As with almost any game, you start out knowing practically nothing about the rules that govern this world, and in the case of both Subnautica and its sequel, this can lead to feelings of terror that very few games are capable of inspiring, especially when it comes to some deep sea spookies you encounter as you go deeper and deeper underwater and underground. But also as with any game, the more you learn about the rules of the world, the less scary and the less immersive everything starts to feel. In the beginning of my Below Zero playthrough, I would switch off the lights on my vehicle when going through dangerous areas, because I imagined that it would make me harder to detect, and therefore safer from dangerous creatures. The key thing here is that I didn't know whether it made a difference or not, but it made logical sense and I was immersed enough at the beginning to treat the situation realistically. Once I'd figured out that it makes no difference at all whether the lights are on or not, and that you can easily tank at least two hits from any monster with no issues, my journeys through dangerous areas pretty much consisted of pointing at my destination, holding the W key, and checking my phone, which I'm sure you'll agree is about as far from immersed as it's possible to be. Look at this, the monsters even spit you out facing the same direction you were looking when they grabbed you, so at least they're polite about it. But how often are you likely to be heading back and forth through the same areas anyway? Well, I'm glad you asked. In one of Below Zero's numerous and excessive above-water areas, you'll probably realise sooner or later that you're not quite equipped to survive for long periods in the low temperatures yet, so you need to leave the area, craft some warmer clothing and then come back. Is that a fun thing to do? Getting to a new region, then finding out you have to turn around because you can't survive there yet? I know you might be thinking, well clearly that was just a late game area, and the game was telling you that you need to progress in the tech tree before coming back. But no, that's not the case here. In the cold, above water region, the material you need in order to craft the warmer clothing, snowstalker fur, is found in that cold region itself. Meaning that there's literally no other way to progress than to come here under equipped, pick up some fur, go back to base to craft some warmer gear, then come back to the cold area again. The game does exactly the same thing with depth upgrades for vehicles, which require materials that are only found deeper underwater. So once again you have to go down to your current max depth, pick up some kyanite crystals, go back to base to craft a depth upgrade, install it in your vehicle, then go back to the area you wanted to explore to go deeper. Whichever way you slice it, this is tedious busy work that will result in you holding W and looking at your phone again. And as I said earlier, it sucks all the joy out of exploring the unique biomes. Perhaps the worst example of this in the game is the bridge that you need to repair in order to get access to a key area. You first come across the bridge in a broken state, scan the damaged part to get the blueprints for it, go back to base and craft a replacement, then come back to the bridge and insert the new part to fix it. This isn't fun and it doesn't involve any interesting choices for the player to make, it just wastes your time. I think the immersion point raises its head here too, since there's nothing inherently wrong with placing unexpected inconveniences in the player's path and asking them to adapt. It's pretty much the whole gameplay loop of the original Resident Evil games, for example, as you have to go back and forth between rooms with items in order to solve puzzles and progress in those games. In Resident Evil, however, you're also juggling resources like health and ammo, and will be painfully aware that every mistake and every shot fired eats into those resources. In Subnautica, the only resource being drained is your time, which is not a problem if you're fully immersed and under the game's spell, but is a big problem if you're not. This is why I think it's not an exaggeration to say that the choice to have you play as a voiced character instead of a blank slate reaches out and affects the whole experience of playing Below Zero. The game needs to be doing everything it can to maintain the illusion that you're really there yourself, and yet in the very first minute of the game, it cuts the cord between you and your avatar with a giant pair of novelty, voice-acted scissors. Holy smokes! That did not go as planned. <laughs> Below Zero actually shoots itself in the foot with regards to immersion at a few points. 
In my opinion, one of the best design decisions from the original Subnautica was the complete lack of any maps, which meant that the player couldn't just focus on a compass or mini-map in the corner of the screen, they actually had no choice but to pay attention to the world. And not just on a micro level of whatever happened to be right in front of them, but on a macro level with regards to their location in the world as well, which you can usually determine by surfacing and looking at your position relative to the crashed ship. Alright, you know by now that the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's different in the sequel. So, Below Zero gives you a map, which can be viewed at any point on your PDA. Granted, you have to find and pick up the map yourself in one of the habitats left over by the science teams, and it also doesn't show your position, so you do still have to figure out where exactly you are, but giving the player any map at all, however bare bones it is, is going to tell them something about the limits of the world, and remove some of the intrigue of the game. Not to mention the negative impact it has on the need for the player to pay attention to their surroundings. The map can point you towards five different research posts in the world, some of which lead to absolutely enormous areas, with most of them actually being above ground, and I wonder if giving the player a map was deemed a necessary evil because of this fact. I think I probably wouldn't have discovered the important land areas at the edges of the play area if not for the map cluing me into their locations since it's understandably rare to be looking upwards while exploring underwater. In Subnautica, you were bound to discover the islands eventually because they extended down quite a bit underwater, but in Below Zero, the land areas at the edges of the map are accessible by narrow passages that are easily missed. If my speculation is correct, and that's why the map was added, then at the risk of beating a dead seahorse, was the inclusion of land areas really worth trampling over one of the things that made the original game so memorable, the lack of maps. And that brings me to the way that Below Zero introduces the player to new biomes and environments. Just as a reminder, the first game slowly revealed distress beacons from other crashed escape pods, most of which had some kind of story log or important technology near them to be scanned for blueprints, and some were even found right next to huge underwater caverns that served as entrances to new biomes. In short, the game nudged you towards new areas subtly enough that you felt like you were discovering them organically, and thanks to your own curiosity. In Below Zero, you get a map. You can also occasionally trigger a conversation with Alan when returning to your vehicle, in which he gives you a location marker for a piece of alien technology. This sometimes led me to a new area to explore, sometimes took me to the middle of nowhere, and once annoyingly took me somewhere I'd already been. Despite these attempts at hints, I ended up completely clueless about where to go for the final of the three alien body part MacGuffins. When playing a game for the first time, I generally try to avoid looking at its wiki. Just like looking at a walkthrough or googling the solution to a puzzle game, I think that checking the wiki breaks a kind of contract between player and game. You're no longer engaging with the game and using your own wits to overcome the challenges it presents you with. You're just going through the motions, as dictated by the good people at Game FAQs. This is just my own personal preference of course, I don't have anything against anybody else who enjoys playing games with a walkthrough to hand. But the reason I bring it up here is because I did check the wiki for Below Zero in order to find the final alien body part I had to scan. And I did it because I simply didn't care about being immersed anymore. I just wanted the game to be over. I want to mention one more thing that makes Below Zero into a very different experience to Subnautica. Whereas the first game dropped you, literally, onto a completely uninhabited planet, in the sequel your character is dropped into a world that has been successfully inhabited by research teams for years. That alone would be enough to wipe out the feeling of being a lone castaway, but the game goes further than this, and actually has another living survivor who interacts with you at scripted points. The alien planet feels a lot less threatening when you can see another human thriving in a lush garden full of rapidly growing food sources, and you can even take seeds and blueprints from Marguerite's greenhouse to grow your own back at your base. Compare that to the first Subnautica, where you discovered the blueprints for grow beds in the ruins of a destroyed habitat. I don't think I need to go into much detail on why this changes the experience so much. Every interaction with Marguerite is another chance for Below Zero to rub in your face that you're playing a very different game to Subnautica, and I hope that I've convinced you that it's a game that does a far inferior job at immersing the player. And when you take away that feeling of immersion, 
All that's left is the mechanical interaction between the player and the game. So you'd better hope it's good enough to pick up the slack. Let's find out if it is. It's not. I've spoken already about the basic mechanical gist of both Subnautica games, which more or less boils down to exploring and finding new materials, crafting upgrades and gear to make your life easier, then going back to explore what you couldn't before. I've also touched on the new elements added in the sequel, like the temperature gauge, but I want to use this section to go into detail on a few areas I haven't mentioned yet. In particular, I want to try and demonstrate that with everything else removed from the equation, that is music, visuals, story, and that intangible immersive quality, there's a disappointing lack of mechanical depth to Below Zero, to the extent that it's even made me rethink my original experience with Subnautica, which is such a depressing thought that I'm just going to ignore it for now and come back to it later. Let's start with vehicles. Subnautica had the Sea Glide, a handheld propeller thing which might be called more of a tool than a vehicle. The Sea Moth, a little one-man sub that functioned more like a moving source of unlimited oxygen than anything else. The Prawn Suit, a mech-like suit with interchangeable arms used for mining or mobility. And the Cyclops an enormous submarine with multiple rooms and functions, capable of transporting another vehicle of your choice, and also allowing you to build almost any internal structure that would normally go inside a stationary base. Throughout the game you were pretty much guaranteed to end up constructing all of those vehicles, and each one was capable of completely changing the feel of the game on its own, by greatly increasing your speed and environmental awareness, solving the oxygen problem, letting you walk along the ocean floor, or reducing your reliance on a stationary base. In Below Zero, the Sea Glide returns, and is likely to be one of the first things you make sure to craft, since of course you already know what a game changer it is. The Prawn Suit is also back, and I assume it works the same way as the first game. I have to assume because I don't actually know. I never built one, because the game never gave me a good reason to do so, but I'll come back to that in just a second. The Sea Moth and Cyclops are both out, but their functions have been sort of combined in a new vehicle, the Sea Truck. All alone, the Sea Truck is pretty much identical to the Sea Moth from Subnautica, but you can add modules to the back for stuff like storage, fabrication, and prawn transport, which turn it into a snake-like moving base, although with less functionality compared to the Cyclops as far as I can tell. Once again, I have to assume, because just like with the prawn suit, the game didn't give me any good reason to experiment with these modules. I built the storage module because I thought the extra space might come in handy, then stopped using it when I realised that it actually didn't. After that, I didn't see any reason to try the other modules. I can hardly believe this, but I actually forgot another new vehicle completely in the first draft of this script, which I think pretty much says it all. The Snow Fox is a land vehicle that provides a reliable source of body heat, similar to the sea truck providing oxygen underwater, as well as a quick way to move around and jump over certain gaps that require a high speed to make it. That's all I can say about it because this is another vehicle I completely ignored, mostly because once I discovered the blueprint to construct it, I really didn't feel like going all the way back to my base and back to manufacture the materials. I had no problems travelling on foot when I was on land, especially after crafting the warmer clothing, and never ran into any scenario where I think I would have been better off using the Snow Fox. There's one possible exception in this wide open plain that needs to be traversed for one of the alien body parts, which obviously would have been quicker with a vehicle, but I think the time I saved by not going back to base for materials probably made it come out roughly even, if a little more dangerous because of this giant sandworm. I mean ice worm. And while I'm at it, that worm is another example of something that seemed frightening and surprising when it was an unknown factor, but quickly turned into little more than a minor annoyance as soon as I understood its limitations. And speaking of being able to completely ignore parts of the game, just like the Prawn Suit and Snow Fox, there are tons of blueprints in the game that I discovered, but never had any good reason to build. I never upgraded a single battery or power cell to its ion equivalent, never built a thermal power station, and never constructed a water filtration unit, just to mention a few. Now of course your immediate response to this might be that this is a fault with me and not with the game, 
Below Zero gives the player a lot of different problems to solve, and a variety of options they can discover and utilise to solve those problems. It's on you that you didn't bother experimenting with those different options. Well, to that I say, why would I bother when the first solution I find is already so convenient? Why go to the effort of constructing a water filtration station when I can just quench my thirst by eating from my infinitely regrowing supply of peppers, courtesy of my neighbour Marguerite? Peppers which also deal with hunger and raise your body temperature on top of that. I have no idea why the peppers are so overpowered, since many other consumables have downside, like coffee raising body temperature but increasing thirst. I also can't see why I would bother going to the trouble of upgrading my batteries to ion ones when I almost never come close to running out of power anyway. I know the thermal power station is for powering bases underground where solar panels won't work, but who's going to build one there when they've already invested a lot of time and resources into a base closer to the surface? Here's an example that also makes for a direct comparison with the first game. In Subnautica, the prawn suit has a much higher maximum depth than the sea moth meaning you have no choice but to construct one and try it out once you get to a certain point in the game. In Below Zero, both the prawn suit and the sea truck can be upgraded to survive at maximum depth. I'm guessing because the prawn transport module you can build for the sea truck needs to be able to go wherever the prawn goes. Either way, as I said before, this just means that you can finish the game without ever building a prawn. So what possible reason do I have to try it? Now it is technically the case that Subnautica can be completed without building a Cyclops, but it's such a unique and intriguing idea that I think almost every player will be curious enough to really want to give it a try. What other game lets you build a vehicle so huge that you need to use multiple cameras to pilot it? If Below Zero had a new vehicle that changed the game in some unforeseen way, I'm sure I would have been motivated to build it and try it out just for the novelty. But it doesn't. It has the prawn suit again, which by now has neither novelty nor utility on its side. So yes, it's true that Below Zero gives you a number of options in how to solve problems, but what it doesn't give you is any reason to explore more than one option. And thinking about it now, I'd say that part of the issue is that the game doesn't actually ask you to deal with any interesting problems to begin with. In order to finish the game, you need to feed and hydrate yourself, keep yourself warm on land, and upgrade the maximum depth of at least one vehicle enough to finish the main fetch quest. That's it. What if there was some kind of critical machinery that could only operate at certain depths? That would give me a reason to experiment with underground power sources like the thermal station or uranium. What if I needed to gather a large amount of small fish to use as bait to distract a bigger creature? I would have a reason to experiment with the grav trap a device which can capture small fish, which I didn't even know the use of until I'd finished the game and saw somebody else using it in a stream. Below Zero doesn't have anything like the stalker teeth in Subnautica, a vital material which you have to show some kind of understanding and mastery over the environment in order to collect, since the stalker creatures only dropped them when they picked up scrap metal to take back to their nest, meaning that you had to understand and interact with them in some way other than go to X biome and pick up Y material. For the sake of fairness though, I should point out that to my memory this is also the only example of that kind of interaction from Subnautica, so it's only beating the sequel by a very small margin in that department. Still, I think it shows the vast potential for interactivity that exists in a game like this, and the fact that the developers went backwards with the sequel instead of forwards doesn't fill me with hope. I want to make one last quick comparison before wrapping up this video with a conclusion. Subnautica was notorious for its poor technical performance, with frame rate drops, assets failing to load, and most frequently of all, the dreaded pop-in of textures and assets when moving quickly through the world. All of these problems remained even after the game was released from early access, meaning that the developers were clearly happy to leave the game in that state. As somebody with no experience of the pressures and deadlines of full-time game development, I don't feel right giving them a hard time for that, but the fact remains that the technical issues are something you need to let go or ignore if you want to enjoy Subnautica. I'm happy to say that I noticed far fewer technical issues in Below Zero, except for the occasional, pretty severe pop-in when returning to my base at speed. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think part of the reason for the improved performance is a lower draw distance which can really ruin the atmosphere of certain areas. 
I mentioned earlier that I had to use the Below Zero wiki to find the last biome I hadn't seen yet, and that biome is called the Crystal Caves. They are absolutely gigantic, and the low draw distance means it's ridiculously easy to lose your bearings. These caves are so cavernous that even the topographical info from the sea glide is useless for finding a way out, which not only makes the biome frustrating to navigate, it also makes it utterly forgettable, since most of your time in it will be spent staring and possibly squinting into nothingness. Compare that to the Mushroom Cave in Subnautica, which is still breathtaking and frightening in equal measure, but much smaller and spatially understandable. And while I'm on the subject here, do I really have to leave the sea truck controls just so that I can equip my sea glide, turn on the map, orient myself and decide which way I need to go, then get back to the sea truck controls and start moving in that direction? If the sea glide can be equipped with the topographical map, then why doesn't every vehicle have one? It's even worse if you don't have any modules attached to the back of your sea truck, because in that case, pressing the button to leave the controls makes you get all the way out of the vehicle, which takes longer and makes you more vulnerable. Playing Below Zero is such a vastly different experience to playing Subnautica that it left me questioning whether I was viewing the first game with rose-tinted scuba goggles. I say that because I'm certain a lot of Below Zero's issues must have been present in Subnautica as well, especially the annoyance of constantly having to return to base to craft upgrades that will let you continue exploring. The crazy thing is that it's almost exactly the same game, at least in terms of minute-to-minute -minute mechanics and progression, but while the gameplay content has been mostly expanded and added to, the context for that gameplay has been totally changed, and it's a change that comes close to killing the whole experience. I didn't notice those little annoyances when I played Subnautica, because I was sold on the reality of the world, but in Below Zero they were all I could think about, outside of the few times when I was awestruck by a new environment I had discovered. Here's the best example I can use to sum up the experiential difference between Subnautica and Below Zero. Both games allow you to capture creatures or their eggs and place them in captivity in your base, and each time you walk by their tank you'll see them swimming around with whatever newly hatched organisms you've recently added. In Subnautica, when I finally reached the end of the game and built the rocket that would take me off the planet where I was stranded, I made sure to go into my base one last time to get into that tank and release all of the creatures I'd been holding, since of course there would be nobody left to do it once I was gone, and I really did feel sad to be saying goodbye to the planet I'd spent so long exploring. I was completely sold on the reality of the world I was playing in, and it just made sense that I had a duty to free those animals before leaving. In Below Zero, it didn't even cross my mind that I'd left my captive fish to die until just now when I was thinking of this comparison while writing the script. For the second half of my playthrough of Below Zero, I just desperately wanted it to be over, and every development that placed another tedious task between me and the ending brought out a heavy sigh and a look at the clock. Despite what must seem like the overwhelming negativity of this video, I really feel for the developers of Below Zero and the difficult choices they must have faced when planning a sequel to Subnautica. The core appeal of the first game is in that sense of discovery and wonder when being dropped into a new environment, but when designing the follow-up they must have felt some pressure to have continuity with the first game. After all, how could you call it a Subnautica game and not include the iconic peepers or bladderfish from the original? The developers at Unknown Worlds clearly didn't want to just remake the same game again, and I respect that choice 100%. Unfortunately, with the changes they chose to implement in the sequel, it really does feel like they missed the point of what made the original so good in the first place. Instead of keeping the incredible sense of immersion that the first game made possible, they kept the gameplay mechanics, which are simply not enough to carry the game alone. I truly don't know how to reconcile this fact, I don't think the developers are stupid, and I feel like they must surely know what the appeal of Subnautica was. They spent years making it and refining it in early access after all. But I think this is a case where the Steam reviews speak for themselves. Below Zero was originally intended as a DLC expansion to Subnautica, 
so it's possible that in the beginning it used the same map and assets from the original, then grew into something bigger, but still held onto all that baggage from the first game. There's got to be a reason they made the design decisions they did for Below Zero. I just have no idea what that reason is. Below Zero is not a bad game by any means, but it was a disappointing sequel in almost every way, and I'm really struggling to come up with an area in which it improves on the original. Playing Below Zero left a bad taste in my mouth, and I'm so sad to say that by the end I was forcing myself to play, desperate for it to be over. I can't help but imagine an alternative follow-up to Subnautica that went in the other direction, with a different planet, different mechanics, and a whole load of new rules to learn and discoveries to make. There's no denying that it would have been a lot more work to make such a game, but ironically, a sequel that was unrecognisable in terms of the original would have been a lot more faithful to it than what we ended up with.